Welcome back, everyone. My name is Beth Bridgman, and I'm a member of the planning committee. Before I introduce our next guest, I'd like to mention that we will um, send participants a list of the books that Adam mentioned from the last session. I'd like now to introduce our next guest, Antea von Geloven, who will be giving a presentation on creating a honeybee sanctuary. Antea is a farmer and gardener at Spikenard Farm and Honeybee Sanctuary in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. There, they take a biodynamic and bee-centric approach to beekeeping. Through education and the creation of a sanctuary, Antea works to promote the health and vitality of the honeybee worldwide. There will be a Q&A following her presentation, so please post your questions in the chat. Antea has also generously agreed to meet people in the water cooler session for those who have additional questions. Thank you for joining us, Antea. Hello, uh, thank you. I'm, um, this is a true honor to be here today and I'm really excited to share about the honeybees, um, which are really close and dear to my heart and also close to the heart of the farm here and the honeybee sanctuary. Um, so I'm gonna just get right into it. Um, yeah, as Beth mentioned, please write your questions as they come up into the chat and I'll try and answer as many of them as I can at the end. Okay, so this is a view of the sanctuary. We are located in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia in Floyd County. Um, you can see a couple of our hives here in the front. And then this big building, that is where I'm sitting today and speaking to you from here. Um, we're really lucky to be surrounded by um, a mountainous region. And so it's pastures and woods and organic farms and we're not afflicted by the pains of um, you know soy and corn agriculture so we're very thankful that this space is safe for the honeybees and free of um, a lot of the pesticides and herbicides associated with that sort of monoculture agriculture Okay, I want to extend my gratitude and respect for Gunter Haug. He is the founder, the co-founder of Spikenard Farm with his wife, Vivian. Uh, they founded the farm in 2006 um, on, with the idea that the, that the honeybee um, needs a sanctuary space to heal. And so it's a nonprofit organization that focuses on education about the honeybees and beekeeping. And then we also have this strong component of our, of our physical farm here, our 40 acres, where we are working with the honeybee, researching, practicing, um, and just falling in love. <laughs> so my, my great gratitude to Gunter Hauk as my teacher here. Also extend gratitude to Alex Tuckman. He is the, the new young energy coming into the organization. Um, he's our, our new director here and also my teacher in beekeeping. And um, I'm standing on these, these two people's shoulders to give you this presentation today. So um, much gratitude for them. So my first question to you is, uh, what is a sanctuary and who is it for? And so when I think of the word sanctuary, I think of a space of healing and safety and protection. And so it's for beings who, um, who need a place to heal and repair and regain their strength. Um, so then the question follows, why do we need a sanctuary for the bees? And essentially, um, the bees are in great decline 
And it's not only the bees that are in decline, it's um, the whole insect world. And so we're acknowledging that the whole insect world is in decline and that the honeybees are sort of this, um, this alarm bell that pulls at, at the heartstrings of human beings sort of more strongly than like the decline of the wasps or the decline of the flies. And that's because of this beautiful relationship that the human beings have with the honeybees. And so um, we provide a sanctuary for the honeybee because we acknowledge the, how essential the honeybees and the whole insect world is for the continued existence of this earth and the continued existence of humanity, that they play a vital role on, in this ecosystem with us. Uh, through pollination, which is the main, you know, the main thing that they are known for, but also the presence of insects is vital for the planet in other ways as well, which are only now um, slowly being discovered. So it goes beyond the, the service of pollination. So I'm gonna start, start with some statistics here. Um, this is the average hive loss per year over the last 10 years. Um, there is a sort of natural die-off rate that you would expect with hives, and that's about 15% per year. Um, that would be a normal, normal rate of death in your apiary. And uh, the national average over the last 10 years is actually at 48% per year. So that is about half the hives are dying every, every year, which is really high. Um, and here at Spikenard, we're at we're at 10 percent per year, which is just such an amazing an amazing figure. And so um, there is something going on here that we are working with that 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 is successful with the honeybees, and it is successful with overwintering them. And um, we have hives here that are living a long time. Our oldest hive is 11 years old. And um, yeah, so that's. That's where we're at with hive loss. So um, the question of why is the honeybee dying um, is a complex question. And there are lots of things that you can point to, such as pesticide and herbicide, uh, the decline of habitat. You could point at like electromagnetic radiation and how that affects the honeybees. You could say that the reason they're dying is colony collapse disorder, which is this mysterious disorder where the honeybee hive is suddenly dead without many bees in it. Um, you could point at all sorts of different pests like the hive beetle or the varroa mite. And um, you could go down this road for a long time. But basically what we have decided is that uh, the honeybee is in decline because our relationship as human beings to the honeybee is broken. So there's a sacred relationship between the human being and the honeybee that uh, needs care. And right now we, we, are, we are in a broken relationship there. So it's really the relationship that we're focusing on healing. And with this comes an acknowledgement that the honeybee is a domesticated animal. And it has been domesticated for thousands and thousands of years. So as human beings, we have a responsibility to care for the honeybee, just as we have a responsibility to care for our other domesticated animals, like our cats or our dogs or our barnyard animals. So we approach our beekeeping with the question, who are you and what do you need? That's the question we're asking to the honeybee. Who are you and what do you need? And when we ask this question, what we get is that each hive is different and each season is different. And, um, and so we can't, we can't come up with, with a blanket idea of who the honeybee is. We have to be living in each moment with each hive and make our, our beekeeping decisions through that. And so um, we're really looking at each hive as an individuality. Each hive has a different name and our beekeeping, beekeeping practice looks different each year with each hive. So 
So with this question, we're prioritizing the health of the honeybee and the vitality of the honeybee. And we're prioritizing what, what, what these hives need over like our goal of honey production or something like that. So we are keeping bees for the sake of the health of the honeybee and not for any sort of productive means for wax or honey or anything like that. And those things come to us as a gift from the honeybee because she often does make a surplus. But our, um, our main goal is to, um, to invigorate the honeybee in her health and her vitality. So with this question of who are you and what do you need, um, we're, we're looking at the hive as, an, as a whole organism. And within this organism, there are many different organs. And this gets into this really special quality of the honeybees where we have a super organism where we have the smaller organisms like the worker bee or the drone or the queen who are individual organisms themselves who have a reproductive cycle. But then we have the larger organism of the hive and each individual bee can't survive without the hive and the hive can't survive without each individual bee. So that's this beautiful super organism that we have here with the honeybees. So um, within this organism, there are many organs you could say the worker bee is an organ. You could say the drone and the queen are a couple other organs. You could even say that the wax comb is an organ of the hive. And you could say that the whole landscape is another organ of each honeybee hive. So I'm gonna go into more depth into these organs of the hive so that we can understand the honeybee on a deeper level. Okay, so we're beginning with the worker bee. She does a lot of work, <laughs> hence the name worker bee. Um, she's a female bee, but um, has actually, her, her reproductive system is not awake. And so she has given up her sexuality for the sake of the hive. And her work begins right as she hatches out inside the hive, she becomes a nurse bee, caring for all the larvae and the eggs and the pupa in the nursery. And then she continues um, to do work inside the hive um, by sweating wax. That's another task of the worker bee, sweating out the wax to build the wax comb. And um, she also works on transforming substance. So she's fermenting the nectar into honey and fermenting pollen into bee bread and feeding the brood. And they are also um, working on temperature control. So with their wings, they can fan and ventilate the hive to cool it down, or they can unhinge their wings and vibrate their thorax muscles to produce heat inside the hive. The inside of the hive has to be at 95 degrees when there's brood, which is most of the year. So throughout the whole year, even in the cold months, the inside of the hive is at 95 degrees. And this, this warmth is, is made by the worker bee within the hive. So then we have the guard bees who are at the entrance guarding the hive and um, protecting from predators and, you know, sort of screening the bees as they come in, breeding each bee, feeding each other, things like that at the entrance. And then they become scouts and foragers. So then they leave the hive and they're flying in a three mile radius or they're, yeah, they're flying, they're foraging within three miles of the hive, um, gathering nectar and pollen and propolis and water. And, you know, there's research that they're also gathering from, from mycelium, from the mushroom. So they're gathering all sorts of substances and bringing them back to the hive for the life of the whole hive. So that is essentially the worker bee. I'm gonna go on and talk about the drone. The drone is this beautiful part of the hive that is largely misunderstood. So here we have a picture of the honey bee worker bee. She's smaller, um, her eyes are smaller, her body is smaller. And then we have the drone who is a lot larger. He's fuzzier, he's um, much stronger with bigger eyes. So the drone actually has twice 
the lenses in his eyes that the worker bee does. And he also has twice the sensors in his antenna compared to the worker bee. And so you can think of the drone as this organ of the hive that is really sensing, sensing, perceiving, and communicating with the surrounding environment. And so, yeah, these huge eyes. So the, the drone is able to go into many different hives. That's one of the things that the drone can do that the worker bee cannot, because she can only go into her own hive. But the drone is actually able to travel into every hive in the apiary and into every other hive in other apiaries within a 15 mile radius of the home hive. So the drone is going in and out of all these different beehives, collecting information with his sense organs and bringing that back to the home hive. And I think that science largely does not um, understand this yet, that the drone is, is a vital part of the hive with its ability to sense and communicate. Um, if you go to the local bee club, you'll hear a lot of jokes made about how useless the drone is and that all he's good for is mating with the queen. And I think that's a large misunderstanding. Um, so we celebrate our drones here. <laughs> um, so it is, it is a big task of the drone to mate with the queen. And this happens um, all throughout the year, but mostly in the spring when there are a lot of new queens. And basically all the drones from the area within about 15 miles congregate in these drone congregation sites that are way up high in the sky. And they congregate there and the virgin queens are led by their maidens up into these congregation areas to be mated. And that is the one time that the queen will get mated. She'll have, um, she'll have enough sperm then for her whole life. And it's, what, what's amazing about this is that the, the, the reason that the drones are coming from a 15 mile radius, which is quite far, um, it really increases the, gene the genetic diversity. And so the queens are being led to mate with drones that are not coming necessarily from her own apiary area, that, that there's, a, there's a gene pool that's more diverse. Okay, so here we are with the queen. She's right in the middle here. Um, this is one of the skills of beekeeping to spot the queen. She's got the long golden abdomen and the wings only come like halfway down the abdomen. And so that's, that's how you spot the queen there. Her work is truly amazing. She is in the darkness of the hive most of the time. She's working in the nursery laying eggs and she's being attended by her, by her maidens who feed her and clean her and groom her. And she is laying more than her own body weight in eggs every day. So that's, it's, I mean, peak season, it's about 3,000 eggs a day. And um, this transformation um, of substance as she's being fed and laying these eggs is just amazing. For more, more than her own body weight, she's laying every day. Here's another picture of the queen. You can see her, she's a little blurry. She's often on the move. So when you see her in the hive, She's usually moving around more than any other of the bees are. Um, but that's her, her big golden abdomen there again. Yeah. So, so there's this reproductive cycle within the hive with the brood nest where the queen is laying eggs and creating more workers and more drones. And then there's this larger reproductive cycle of the hive where one hive becomes two hives. And that is this beautiful process of swarming. And that begins with the queen laying a queen egg in a queen cup. So it's this beautiful coming together of, of the worker bees creating this queen cup and then the queen laying an egg in it. And at that moment, the whole hive has decided that they will go through a swarming process and create another hive out of their one hive. And um, once this queen is close to maturing and close to hatching out of this queen cell, you can see this queen cell here. It's this big vertical one. Once she is in there, close to hatching, the 
hive sort of goes through this internal split where about half the bees align with the old queen who's going to leave in the swarm and then half the bees align with this new queen who's about to hatch out. And what happens then? Swarming is like one of the most amazing things. So you see here, this picture is just, I mean, I've, Alex took this picture, it's quite incredible. So you see the queen here, she's fanning and she's drawing out the bees that have aligned with her to leave the hive in this swarming process and go out and start a new home and start a new hive. And so when this happens, it looks like complete chaos at first. There's just thousands and thousands. I mean, it's like, I think it's like 20,000 to 25,000 bees up in the air, it's super loud, really beautiful. And then in about 15 or 20 minutes, they, they gather onto a branch and they hang in a cluster. And when they're hanging in this cluster, um, they're basically waiting as scout bees go out to find a new home. So when you find these clusters, they're usually close to the hive that just swarmed. They go through this process of exiting the hive, gathering in this tree or on a fence post or something. And then they send out scouts to find a suitable home, which would be like a hollow tree or the side of, you know, the inside of a hollow wall or a chimney or something like that. And if they don't find a suitable home in this two mile radius, then they'll move the whole swarm and hang in a different location and then send out scouts again to try and find a place. So the truth about these swarms is that um, the swarms that swarm into the wild that the beekeeper does not catch, only about 25% of them make it through the first winter. And so um, that's not many. So I think in this partnership between the honeybee and the human being, um, this is one of the essential tasks of the beekeeper is to catch the swarm and provide a body um, for her to continue her life. So this is our main task here in the springtime. It's about April, May, and June that we're constantly looking for swarms and catching them and providing new bodies for new hive beings. And it's a really exciting task. Sometimes it can be a little tricky. Here's Alex way up high in a locust tree catching a swarm that decided to go way up high. So it can be quite exciting. Got ladders and saws and all sorts of tools for this. And so we, we bring the, high, the swarm down and then our first choice as a beekeeper is what sort of hive body do we want to introduce this swarm into? And this is a very important moment because once you introduce the swarm, this is their home. You can't, I mean, you can't easily move them into a different hive style. So um, we work with a lot of different styles here at the sanctuary. And our main considerations are warmth and roundness. And this is, this speaks to like what the honeybee needs for her health. And so the warmth, I spoke a little bit earlier how the inside of the hive has to be kept at 95 degrees. So we want a hive that has one entrance and that is well insulated and that the shape of it is conducive to staying warm inside, even through really cold winters. So we've got a couple, a few different styles here. Some of them are quite common. A lot of them we've designed here at Spike and Ard Farm. So we've got a round hive here on the left that we designed here. It's made out of like a cow dung paste, cob paste. So it's well insulated and it's round. And then we've got the Warre hive here, which is um, originally a French design. It's similar to the Langstroth hive, which is sort of the, um, the conventional hive style, but it's, um, it's, it's square instead of rectangular. And then on the bottom here, we have um, the, the Colorado top bar style, which is also a common beekeeping um, style in the natural beekeeping world. 
Um, we consider that style a little bit more suited for warmer climates than colder climates because of its shape. And then we have a couple more that we've designed here at Spike and Art Farm as experimental hive shapes for the bees. And then this top one is the sun hive, which I'd like to go into more depth in here. The sun hive is this beautiful round skep like hive that has been designed um, for, for, yeah, for the health of the honeybee, really. So we weave these sun hives from rye straw that we grow on our farm here. Um, this is a picture of the weaving process. We're weaving a top and a bottom part. Um, and then it becomes this beautiful round enclosure for the honeybee. Then it's, it's combined with some wooden ware and then pasted with a cow dung cob paste. And so it's really well insulated. And then we hang these under a gazebo so that the rain doesn't destroy them. And um, they are, we are able to go into them, which is sort of um, the unique feature of the sun hive because the traditional skeps you aren't able to actually open necessarily. So we are able to open these and do our health checks, which we do like once a year for the sun hive or maybe not even every year. And here you can see this beautiful round shape that the bee can, can create here with these cones. So the organization in these sun hives is just so beautiful. You see the capped honey on the top there and then uh, the comb that was brood nest on the bottom there. And uh, they overwinter really well in these hives. And they also give a lot of swarms because it's a, it's a fixed space. Okay, so once you decide your hive shape, then the swarm is introduced into the hive. And uh, maybe some of you saw that video, that this is a picture of that video mm -hmm. that was played uh, before my presentation of the bees walking in. So that's one of the fun things we do is we'll, we'll put the bees out front actually here, shake them out, and then they'll walk into their hive, which is just a beautiful thing to witness. Um, yeah. And then once they've walked into their hive, you can imagine that the first thing that has to happen, the first task is to sweat wax to create the comb, which is going to hold um, the life of the, of the hive. So they hang in these chains to uh, measure, measure the space and start sweating the wax for the comb. And this, this sweating process is so important for the honeybee's health. They're, they're actually consuming honey and then transforming that within their metabolism and then sweating out these wax platelets on their abdomen, which they then pluck off their abdomen and with their mandibles, they create the wax comb. This really beautiful natural wax comb. And so this becomes the foundation of the life of the hive. So this is where the pantry is where the honey is stored, where the pollen is stored. It's um, also where the nursery is, where the eggs are laid and the larva and the brood is maturing. So this is the inner structure that they create. And when you're working with natural comb, you get these beautiful, these beautiful waves that, um, that you don't get if you're working with artificial comb. And these waves were intuiting actually help keep the hive warm, that it's a, it's a more efficient use of space for, for warming the hive. So I'm gonna start with the nursery. These are the eggs that the queen lays. There's one neatly placed in the bottom of each of these cells. They look like little rice kernels. I have a close-up picture here of an egg. Sometimes the eggs fall down to the bottom tray that we, that we look at every week. And um, that's always exciting. So this beautiful egg that the queen lays, um, and then that in about three days hatches into a little larva. And you can see the larva here at the bottom of each cell. It's like a little U-shaped wormy. It's sitting there in a pool of royal jelly, um, getting nourished and growing. And then eventually the larva will stretch out and spin a silk cocoon around itself. And then it'll be capped. And this is 
what we refer to as pupa. And the pupa, the middle here, you have the worker brood, which is, um, they've got domed caps, but that aren't quite as domed as these br drone brood. So the drones are significantly bigger, so their caps are, are much more bulgy there. And this is a beautiful organization of the brood nest here with the, the worker brood in the middle and the drone around the outside. Yeah. So that's the nursery. And then we go to the pantry. So the bees are out foraging. They're collecting nectar, nectar and pollen. I'm going to start first with the, with the path of, of nectar. So the bees collect the nectar from the flowers, from the forage, and they bring it back to the hive and store it in these cells where it goes through a fermentation process. Um, so the, the gut bacteria of the bee is very important in this process. So the bee is ingesting the nectar and then regurgitating it multiple times. And then they're fanning their wings over nectar to reduce the humidity of it. And then that becomes a stable fermented substance, which we call honey. And then that is capped and this will last forever is truly amazing. So this capped honey, oh, <laughs> the, the honey is used, um, the honey is used in the beehive for warmth. So the bees are ingesting the honey and then creating warmth for the hive. It's used as a food source for energy to carry out the work of the hive. And it is also used I'm forgetting now what the third one was. Oh, for the wax. That's a really important process. So when the bees are sweating wax, they're ingesting a whole lot of honey before that process. Um, so that the transformation of substance in the beehive is quite amazing. And then the honey is also a gift to the human being, to the beekeeper. And we, we really view this as a true gift, and we're only taking honey when it is in surplus in the hive which for us is in April. So our harvest time is when the dandelion is blooming, when the bees have made it through the winter and any honey that is in the hive at that point is a, is a surplus of stores that they did not need to use through their survival of the winter. So this is different than what most people do. Most people harvest all the honey in like August and September, and then the hive is left with no honey for the winter. And then the bees are fed corn syrup or sugar to make it through the winter. Um, so we are feeding our bees only honey, their own honey. We're not doing any sort of sugar feeding. And that means that the honey that we get as a gift from the hive is really the true surplus that they do not need. Okay, so then um, here's the path of pollen. Pollen is gathered from the flowers as well. It's sort of like statically sticks to the hairs of the honeybee. And then she packs it down into these pollen sacks on her hind legs and then brings that into the hive where it is packed down into cells. And this is another transformation of substance. So the pollen is mixed with water and then it is sort of like kneaded into a bread. So it's sort of like a sourdough bread fermentation that happens here. And, um, that's why it's called bee bread. So it's a fermentation process of pollen. And this bee bread um, will get fed to larva. It also gets eaten by the worker bees and then transformed um, internally using glands in their head that will then exude royal jelly. And this royal jelly is just this beautiful refined substance that is fed to the queen and that is also fed to the younger larva of workers and drones. Okay, so you can see how the life of the honeybee is really connected to the landscape. And so we do think of the landscape as one of the organs of the hive. And so in order to have a healthy honeybee hive, you need to have a healthy landscape. And so most of our work on the sanctuary here is actually on the land. We're planting 
gardening and providing as much healthy, beautiful forage that we can. And um, one of the, so I guess we're gonna go through a little exercise here um, and put on our like nectar flow lenses and look at the landscape through that lens of like, what is in bloom? Where is their pollen? Where is their nectar? And throughout the whole year, where are the bees getting their nourishment from? And so in our area, there are definite gaps in sort of the natural landscape. We have a couple of months in July and in August where there isn't much nectar flow. And so our plantings concentrate on that area in the year so that we're providing forage in that time of year. It's also good to provide forage way early in the season so that when the bees are coming out of winter, they have um, some good pollen and nectar sources right away in March. So I'm going to march through the year here um, quite quickly with just a view of our forage through one season. And so we begin with the pussy willows and um, all the blooming trees. So like maples and oaks and tulip poplars and black locust, those are all really important forages for the bees earlier in the year. The next really important one is the dandelion. And the dandelion, as I mentioned before, is this is for us a, a signal that we have made it through the winter, that the bees have made it through the winter, that there will be forage now, and that um, any honey that they have is a, is a true surplus. So that is the dandelion blooming is our signal for for any honey harvest that we want to do. Here we have the Nanking cherry on the left, and then we have the dead nettle on the right. Many of the early garden weeds are actually really good for the bees. They really love the dead nettle, so they will be all over it. And the early blooming shrubs are also really important and well-loved by the honeybee. Then we have our fruit trees. Um, we have, this is an apple blossom on the left and our quince blossoms on the right. So we've planted lots of different varieties of fruit to provide that spring forage for the bees. I love this picture of the poppies. The poppies are like so exciting when they're blooming. The bees are just all, all in them and there's like 10 bees in one flower and they're just rolling around and gathering the pollen. So that one's a really fun one to grow in your garden if you're um, looking to attract the honeybees. And then all the herbs, um, thyme and oregano and um, yeah, chives, all sorts of herbs the bees love. So here we have sage on the left. So we love the sage blooming. And then borage on the right, also a favorite for the honeybees. This one was sort of surprising for me. We have this big asparagus patch and I had never thought of asparagus as having a flower, but it's got these tiny little flowers and the bees really love it. They're all over the asparagus patch when it's blooming, um, really loud over there when the asparagus is blooming. So if you have an asparagus patch, you can keep your eye for that. This is the echinacea. A lot of the medicinal plants that we grow for human beings are also of medicinal use for the honeybee. And so um, we, have, we have a big medicinal garden and in that garden, we're focusing on diversity more than we're focusing on quantity. So we have a diverse forage, lots of little amounts of lots of plants. And that really helps with the, with the health of the honeybee and the building of the immune system. This is Gaiardia, a beautiful prairie flower. So this is our, this is our view from the top of the mountain. It's just so beautiful. You can see the gazebo there where we have the sun hive hanging. And this is our field of buckwheat. So buckwheat is this 
really, really amazing cover crop that I like to throw in in any field or, or garden space that is in transition. It's really fast. It blooms within like four or five weeks. And um, the bees really love it. And it's a, it's a huge nectar source for them. And if you're, if you're looking for the bees activity on the buckwheat, you should look around 10 a.m. They're really only there for like an hour in the morning. And then the plants stop giving nectar. So for the rest of the day, you, there won't be much activity there. But um, I highly recommend planting buckwheat for the pollinators. This is our bottom field. We're cultivating about four acres um, just in cover crops for bee forage. And the cover crops that we're working with, the ones in this picture are yellow mustard in the back there and buckwheat in the front here. And the other ones we're working with are things like crimson clover, uh, white Dutch clover, yellow sweet clover, and sunflowers is another one that we're working with. So it's really beautiful to plant a big, big cover crop if you have a field or a farm and um, let that be forage for the bees. And this is, this is the field where we're really concentrating on that nectar flow gap in the middle of the summer between July and August, we're hoping that this field is blooming at that time um, to fill in that gap for the bees. We're also working on prairie planting. Um, my favorite source for prairie, prairie inspiration and seeds is Prairie Moon Nursery. So I can highly recommend them. Um, they've got lots of good mixes and lots of uh, good information on how to start prairie flowers. Um, which are often also in bloom in that, in that nectar flow gap in the summertime. So this is Korean Evodia, also known as BB tree. And um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful tree slash shrub that blooms really heavily. And the bees are just, just love it all over it for a long time. This is Liatris spicata or a prairie blazing star. Really beautiful prairie plant. And so we're moving more into the fall forage now. This is more of a September bloom around here. Um, the biggest like field weed in the cow pastures, which the farmers here hate is stickweed or wing stem. And the, it's amazing because the bees totally love it. So all these pastures are like overgrown with this weed and the bee, it's a huge nectar source for the bees. So this is one of our big fall forages. And then the asters, when they come out, that's a huge fall forage for the bees and pollinators. And then the other big one in the fall is goldenrod. And so we're working with multiple different varieties of goldenrod. This one's showy goldenrod, really beautiful variety. So there we go. That's the land as an organism of the honey, or as an organ in the honeybee organism. And some ideas for working on your landscape for the honeybees. So I wanna just review or summarize um, our spike and method of beekeeping. Um, this is like what I've been talking about in this presentation, but it's nice to put it all together here. So hive forms that respect and approach roundness and promote hive warmth and scent. The bees make their own natural wax comb. The hive is respected as an organism and nurtured in its inherent tendencies for the creation of workers, drones, and natural queens. The celebration of swarming as the most vital and sustainable method of expanding the apiary, breeding queens, and selling bees and hives. The adoption of a conservative approach to the feeding of sugar and harvesting of honey. A holistic approach to healing and treatment an understanding of the land and the bees as one, and a focus on providing the best bee forage. So, I mean, it might make perfect sense. This all might make perfect sense and be like 
So how, how would you beekeep any other way than this? And um, I didn't go into depth, like what conventional beekeeping practices look like right now, but I can just say overall that um, this is not what conventional beekeeping looks like. And so you can sort of imagine that if you're not, if you're not honoring these things for the honeybee, then you would expect them to go into decline and be unhealthy. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's this part of the relationship where we're really honoring their health and vitality first. And so we're honoring all of these things first. And then what we get is healthy bees, healthy, thriving bees. So here's a couple other ideas for your landscape if you're hoping to attract pollinators and the honeybees. Um, we have a little a bee pond, which is a, a nice access point for, for water, which the honeybees do need. So even putting out a little bird bath can be helpful for the honeybees and the pollinators as a source of clean water so that they're not going and gathering water from like your neighbor's pool, which has chlorine in it or something like that. And then this is our pollinator condo. So one thing that's so beautiful is that as we've concentrated on these 40 acres, as we've concentrated on the health of the honeybee and providing honeybee forage, we've just noticed that the whole realm of pollinators and the whole insect world has just thriving here. I mean, we're seeing all sorts of species here that are quite rare and so in continued support of the whole realm of pollinators, we built this pollinator condo. It's made out of little hollow reeds, bamboo sticks or hollow sticks, and then logs that we drill with either one fourth inch or one eighth inch drill bits. And this provides um, little homes for all sorts of pollinators to lay their eggs. And you can see here the leaf cutter bee has been hard at work plugging up all these holes with these little bits of leaves that she's gathered. And so in there is her nest, her eggs that are all set up to hatch and, and thrive. So at the Honeybee Sanctuary here, we're really focusing on education as this is a nonprofit organization and we want to inspire people worldwide to promote the health and vitality of the honeybee. And so we have all sorts of opportunities here. Um, you can visit, usually this year we did not have visitors, but I'm sure there will be opportunities to visit in the future and meet all the hives and um, be in the sanctuary space. We also have college classes come and visit and do some experiences with us. Here we're looking at the debris trays that we use underneath our Langstroth hives. Um, so this is sort of like a picture of what's going on in the inner life of the hive that we can look at without having to open up the hive completely. We also do school groups. So we've had, um, I think we've had third graders all the way through 12th graders come and have experiences on the sanctuary. We have camping, so there's overnight stays. This 12th grade happened to come right when there was a swarm. So we're here catching this beautiful swarm together really exciting. They were also able to harvest honey with us early in the springtime. And this year we've really had to focus on our webinars, which has been amazing. We've got people tuning in from all over the world. And so we have a really good webinar series um, that is for sale on our website, lots of different options. And um, good like beginner webinars and also some topics that go deeper for people who are more experienced with beekeeping. And then um, at some point we'll get back to having in-person classes, which are really beautiful, um, usually two to three day experiences on the sanctuary where we're doing lectures and we're also out opening hives, working with the bees and having experiences with the bees on the land. And then we also have internships available. And so our applications will be open soon for next year. Um, it's a beautiful, immersive experience working every day on the sanctuary, on the land, in the gardens, and also participating in the beekeeping. 
So I hope I gave you some, some things to feel inspired about and some ideas for how you can work with your land and um, start noticing the pollinators um, maybe a little differently, thinking about the honeybee a little differently and our relationship and responsibility to her. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm really, I just have one more here. Um, our website is spikenardfarm.org. We have a newsletter, um, an active newsletter. So you can sign up for that. We've got our products and webinars on our website. And then we're also focusing on social media this year a little more. And so we're maintaining our Facebook page, our Instagram, and our Twitter account. So please stay in touch with us. And um, I'm going to stop screen sharing here. And I'll be open for questions. Thank you so much, Antea. That was just so exciting. I'm just all fired up now. Um, <laughs> lots and lots of people were asking questions um, during your presentation. There's lots of questions here. so. Um, if you want to go over to the chat and, and answer them yourself, or I can read them to you. One of the first ones um, was about sweating out the wax, and I think you answered that one. Um, what information is the drone collecting from other hives is one of the questions. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, I think um, this isn't super well understood yet, but I, I think that part of what's being collected is like information on where are there new queens, like what hives are going through a, a requeening process. And then um, also information on, you know, different forages that different hives are gathering and just an, an overall reading of the, of the apiary and the surrounding landscape through the honeybee. So that's, that's my understanding of it now. I think there's a lot more there that can be discovered, yeah. That's so beautiful. Um, I doubt if we'll get through all the questions. I just want to remind folks, we'll, we'll do more questions here now, but also Antea will be available in the, um, in the water cooler after this is over as well. The next question, Antea, is can you explain the connection to industrial agriculture and the loss of bees? That's a million dollar question, isn't it? Um, um, yeah, so the connection to industrial agriculture with what? And the loss of bees. Oh, and the loss of bees. Gosh, I mean, in a nutshell, I think like if we're not honoring our relationship with the honeybee, um, then then we see the loss of bees. And so with industrial agriculture, especially industrial beekeeping or like commercial beekeeping, you've got beekeepers who have like 2,000, 3,000 hives and they're trekking them on semi trucks, like from the blueberries in Maine to the oranges in Florida to the almonds in California. And so these bees are being trucked around to monocultures. So, you know, they're eating almond blossoms for three or four weeks, you know, which you can imagine if we're eating almonds for two or three weeks, we wouldn't feel that good. And so the honeybee probably doesn't feel that good about it either. So, um, I mean, I think there's just a lot there the the industrial agriculture is obviously not geared towards the health of the honeybee in like any way at all <laughs> yeah is the queen fed a diet any different than the others to cover her immense energy needs yeah yeah that's a really really good question because i think the queen's diet is part of what makes her different from every other bee so when she's in her larval stage she's only fed royal jelly, whereas other bees will be fed royal jelly for the first like two days of their larval stage, and then they'll be fed bee bread. And so the, the, the different in nourishment does, um, does determine like that she is a queen and not just a female worker bee. And so, and then as an adult, she's being fed royal jelly only. And so that the royal jelly, again, is that transformed bee bread exuded through the glands in the head and then fed to the queen. So it is, it's a highly refined substance, highly, highly nutritious and highly refined substance. Yeah. Wow. Um, during swarming, are the bees more defensive? Is there a higher likelihood of being stung if you were nearby during swarming? 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the stinging question is funny because you might have noticed that we actually don't wear any sort of protection with the bees. And um, that is just part of us honoring that relationship that we are coming to the bees just as vulnerable as they are to us. So um, they can hurt us just as much as we can hurt them. So, um, so we do get stung once in a while, and we sort of view that as part of our communication with the beehives. Um, and the swarms are so beautiful because they're really not aggressive at all. That's like the least aggressive time. And it's, um, it's just amazing to work with them because that is the time of year where you're doing the most hands-on work with the bees and um, very few things. Yeah, of course there are accidents. You know, we've like accidentally dropped swarms or stuff like that happens and then you, then you might get quite a lot of stings. But um, they're generally considered really docile when they're in their swarming process. Wow. Yeah. Um, we have a question here and I don't know if you'll know it since you're um, not in Ohio anymore. I wanna say that um, Antea used to be a student at Antioch College. Um, so uh, one of the questions is, how do we know where to get our honey from? Um, how do we know he people who are practicing non-sugar feeding? Right. Yeah, I think the only way to know that is to is to be able to ask the beekeeper. So then that would be in like farmers markets um, where you can ask the beekeeper what sort of feeding practice they're using with the bees. Um, but I will say that it's quite uncommon to only feed honey the way that we do, that most people are feeding sugar. And in that scenario, there are sugars that are better than others. So like if they're feeding corn syrup, that's like worse than if they're just feeding sugar. <laughs> so you can, you can ask, be a little nuanced about that. Yeah, it can get tricky. Uh, here's another question. There's still a lot more. Um, do native plants matter? for bee foraging like, like it does for other insects? Is it more important to have native plants? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question of invasive species is so interesting, you know, and um, it, is, it is interesting that there are some invasive species around here that are providing huge bee forage for the bees. And so um, it isn't the case that they need only native plants. They're actually making use of some you know, invasive species as well. Um, especially the blackberry in this area it takes over everywhere. And when the blackberry is blooming, it's this huge nectar flow for the bees. Um, yeah, so I would say it probably doesn't, they don't have as, as specialized of a relationship as other pollinators do with specific flowers. Yeah. And then here's another question. Uh, do you plant buckwheat in the spring? Um, I mean, you definitely could. I'm not usually starting my buckwheat plantings until like July. Yeah. But um, you can seed buckwheat like all year long. I think the last time we seeded it was maybe late August. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone else mentioned that OPN seed here in Ohio is great for prairie seeds. And then another question is, um, how do you harvest honey from the round and wavy combs? Oh yeah, um, yeah. That's the that's the fun part about working with natural combs is that you have to be creative. Um, so, as is the the style with like with the worry hives and the top bar hives, when you don't have a frame like a traditional Langstroth frame that fits into an extractor, when you have sort of different shapes that you're working with. Um, then we use a crush and press method where we're taking the comb and crushing it up and straining it through a strainer. And that's how we're harvesting the honey. Um, but we're also not harvesting as much honey from those other hive styles. So different styles sort of are conducive to different things. And um, like the sun hives don't usually produce an excess of honey, but they do give a lot of swarms. So different hive styles sort of like promote different things. Yeah. I'm gonna have one more question here and then we'll let you finish up uh, the rest of the questions over in the water cooler. Um, this last question for this session is um, clearly, and you've answered it a little bit, but um, you know, you don't use protection bonnets. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you establish that trust? You know, coming in from the outside, not having this experience, how do you first establish that trust? Yeah. 
Um, hmm. Well, so we are like when you're not wearing protection and you arrive to your beekeeping tasks with that vulnerability, you are so much more awake in your senses to how the bees are doing. So we start by, you know, giving them a little bit of smoke and then we're like listening. And sometimes the sound is like so aggressive that we're like, okay, I don't think they really want to be opened right now, you know, but most of the time they give a nice little hum and then we go ahead and crack the lid open. And usually you get, um, I mean, we go through our whole beekeeping often without anybody getting a single sting. But if, if a hive is getting upset, you sort of know it before you get stung, she'll give you like these warning signs. So she'll come up and like buzz you in your face or she'll, you know, she'll like ting you on your forehead or something. She'll bump into you. And those are sort of signs that she would actually like to get closed up. And so we go ahead and close her up and then, and then we usually don't get stuck. So that's, yeah, you just, <laughs> it's a slow process. I think, I mean, it's also intimidating. So it's not that we're prescribing that everyone should ditch all their, all their suits. Um, if you're new and you're nervous, it's better to, to wear protection and not be nervous around the bees than it is to, to be really anxious and try and do it without protection. So, but I would definitely say for those who are keeping bees to take your gloves off because that's, that's the easiest one to start with. And then you have more dexterity with your fingers. <laughs> Well, and they usually don't sing your hands anyway. So that is just fascinating. I'm just I'm just so inspired. Um, it's so good to see you again after all these years. And I want to thank you so much for this presentation. Um, 